This is Dash, and I had to come and preface this video to give you guys a little bit of insight on exactly what is to follow. Last week, I went to Austin, Texas, and I met up with a few other YouTubers, and we spent a couple days together. We spent two days together. The first day, we did a barbecue crawl, and at the end of our barbecue crawl, we went to Louie Mueller's Barbecue, and we, after we finished eating, we had a tour from Wayne Mueller, who is the third generation pit master and owner of Louis Mueller's Barbecue. Now, if you do some homework, you do some research, you'll find that Central Texas style barbecue has pretty much originated from Louis Mueller. And do yourself a favor, watch this entire video. The history that is spoken in this video is bar none. And I'm going to apologize now. There are some points where I was a little far from where Wayne was when he was speaking. So you can't hear him as clearly as I would like you to have heard him as clearly as we did while we were in the room. But do yourself a favor. Watch this video in its entirety. You will not be disappointed in the amount of history that comes across in this video. I implore you to watch this video. It's an hour long. I did not want to cut it up at all because I didn't want you to miss any single uh, moment of what he had to say about this place. It is an institution and I cut a piece of it out to give you a bit of preface to tell you how this whole thing started. With that being said, I'll throw it to Wayne. Uh, my name is Wayne Miller. I'm the third generation owner of Pitmaster of Louis Miller Barbecue in beautiful downtown Taylor, Texas. Yes, sir. Central Texas to the core. All right. Welcome. Thank you. You know, I had my epiphany about what I am and what this place is when I was sitting at the end of this table, just kind of staring at these walls one day. And it was before the map, but you could read what people were originating. And it really just started to dawn on me. It's like, oh, shit, they're coming from everywhere. Um, this isn't even, then I can hit me, you know. This isn't my place. This isn't, even, this isn't my family's place. This belongs to everybody who's up here. This is their place. And this is sort of like the bricks of ownership. You know what I mean? Because if you took all of the collective time, both in travel and in actual experience in this building, that everyone has had, and you put it on a timeline, and then you put everyone who's worked here, especially family members, on a on a, on a collective timeline, and you compare the actual duration of time between the two, what we've spent here versus this is just a single sliver of time. It makes up no time at all. That's when you realize it's really, it's not your place. You're just sort of captaining the ship at the moment, but it was here before you. You don't fuck it up, it'll be here after you. <laughs> right? And, and, and it will go on. It's not, I realized what an institution was at that moment in a way that I hadn't understood it before. Yo, this is Dash. Get ready. Okay, so come on. Hi Christina. <laughs> Bye Christina. <clears throat> My state of the union. <laughs> exactly. So where we're standing when I was growing up until nineteen ninety nine, this was all parking lot. This is the exterior of the wall. Now, along this wall were a lot of bricks and a few just remaining power lines coming out of those T brackets along the side of the wall. So those were swinging opportunities when I was growing up. <laughs> Dad didn't like us doing it because he knew we'd kill ourselves on the bricks. And we had more wipeouts than I care to admit, and you never told Dad because he'd beat your ass twice. <laughs> you should try so, out, kid. Yeah, I grew up here starting when I was eight. And this was one of, one of the things that we did. Um, like I said this was built in 99. Um, it was really going to be more like a, an ice house. So the front 
you can still see some of the remnants. So we've got this chassis up here, and there's some counterweight tubes. The whole front door would raise up, just like in an ice house, and this was all screened in. They didn't design it very well, unfortunately, because they should have had these lifting up as well. The first, <laughs> the first thing they opened this up, the flies came in and they had no way of getting out. <laughs> so it was one of the Egyptian, ten Egyptian plagues in here for like two weeks, flies and stuff. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, it was horrible. It was like Amityville or something. Um, so a few years ago, I'm like, we need a uh, climate controlled room. So we started making this first heating, then air conditioning, and the fans. Uh, insulated the windows, shut everything in. So now, at least we have an opportunity for younger folks and older folks to have a climate in which they can actually enjoy this and not have to be, believe me, when it's summertime in that room, it can be impressively hot. So this is sort of a respite from that. And the, and the deck is sort of an extension of that too. Uh, give people outdoor opportunities, people with dogs, a place for them to bring their animals. It's also a place in the covered pavilion area that we'll start holding classes out there. And I think it's going to really res resign itself very well to that sort of environment. So we've got some bathrooms out there. We've got a bar that I'm building out there. Um, it'll be pretty self-sufficient when that's finally complete. In here, there, there are some unique things about who we are still located here. Behind us is an old stuffer. Now this, this old stuffer came out of Ohio uh, circa 1909-1913. Old. It was only a backup stuffer that we used when my grandfather had a grocery store across the street. Um, we had a water press there. I mean, it literally took up a whole room. Um, but instead of hydraulics, it, it uses just pressure, water pressure in the line. And uh, it was too big and clunky to move over. So when my grandfather closed the grocery store, my father took over the restaurant, he brought that with him to make, to stuff his sausage. And that's how he did it for the next you know, 24 years. It wasn't until 2000 that we actually mechanized it a bit more, but yeah, that's what dad used in, you know. It, it, I started, started twisting sausage when I was nine, and I quickly nicknamed that piece of equipment Cranky. <laughs> because well, obviously because you're cranky but that was my dad's you know demeanor when he got finished stuffing sausage he was never happy it's just like yeah it fits so fits you know um, and there's actually a, an image of, of dad using that sausage stuffer that's uh, from Texas Monday in 1974 This um, Coca-Cola machine was literally in front of the, uh, the grocery store, my grandfather's grocery store, up until I would say 67, 68, and then he switched it out, um, and then it switched out again in the mid 70s. But why he held on to this one and not the other ones, I don't know. He did, and it was it was in storage for a long time. I'm like, oh no, that needs to come out like all of these pieces. My father's like, nobody cares. I'm like, Hey, do this like a museum. Are you kidding me? It's a walk through time. Um, so, I, at some point in time, I would love to have that reconditioned and working again. I think the, the bigger problem is not to find the, yeah, the, the labor or someone to do it, to find the, the sourcing for the, the bottles. But that would be cool. I do remember those when I was a kid. Um, next to it, we have a couple of maps. One is a 50 US state map, and the other is a world map. Put those up in 2010. Really, just as a way to help the staff. I mean, let's face it, geography isn't many people's strengths, right? Well, especially if you never leave the area. So, to try to, to try to help my staff visualize the distances which people travel to come have an experience with this, I said, well, we'll just put a map up there. I mean, you'll see in a minute we've got this credit or this business card wall that sort of started out in a similar way. This is also a, a method by way of people leaving a little bit of themselves here with us, right? Um, so this is sort of their card when they don't have one. But it, it, it showed my staff, look, there are people literally coming from these places. Come and look at this every once in a while. And for months, the staff was just 
there was a lot of comparing. I remember talking to that dude, or I remember talking to this person. Um, and it built, I think, a stronger sense of understanding and unity that well, maybe this place is sort of special. If you don't ever know, you never know. I mean, you, until I left, I didn't know what this place was. Right? I mean, this is all, this is the only thing I knew about Barbara. I didn't know anything. Um, the world taught me otherwise, and it really taught me a true appreciation. Uh, the girl up on top next to the Christmas tree, that's my daughter. She's making sausage. <laughs> She's got it going on. She's about seven now. About uh, now. Seventeen. She's about how far? No. She's seventeen. Maybe now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. <laughs> She still loves sausage, though. So, um, but she's she can look me in the eye now. She's about seven, six foot tall. So, um, the tree itself that never comes down. There's another one in the main dining room. Those, that's the homage to my mother. In 1992 ish, could have been 93. I'm not really kind of fuzzy on which year. Uh, my mother brought the Christmas ornaments out for the last time, and it's not because she passed away. It's just because she never put them up again. So there have been a, there's a tree up still, in, two trees up in her house still to this day. Uh, yeah, they have not come down for the last 20, <laughs> what, eight years or some craziness. Yeah, so there's not much to mom around. There's stuff to grandpa and dad. Christmas tree is homage to mom. Right? Um, this is, George, just to keep this cool. Up here, I'm, I already did the works of a stained glass window for the cathedral. Thank you. Back to my dad. It's dope. 
So I've got, I don't know, probably 25 of these chairs in different stages of deconstruction and reconstruction of the house that need to be reintroduced. Um, and it's one of those things, don't change it. My father's genius when he took over was, you know, I think we all have that need to sort of put our stamp on things, personalize it to us a little bit. His pure genius was not changing anything and allowing this to sort of stay in its organic state and remain in its original sort of condition and do the best he could to maintain it that way. And when you hear people come in and go, I've been coming here since you guys moved over to this space in 59, and it's, it's like I remember. That's, to me, it's just like, okay, we're doing it right. Yeah. Because you got more stuff on the wall, you know, it's really updated. Everything's digital now instead of analog, but, you know, space is, is still the space. So, you know, don't ever change it. Uh, believe me, I know. Don't ever change it. Um, old jukebox has been around for a while. It has to work since mid-70s. Found out it's a little too hot and dry in here for, for the vinyl. And so the records just stood a little cheap in the back and just didn't grow. They didn't, they just didn't last. Um, it's made its way onto a few um, album covers, mostly European. Right. And I want to say Greg Saul, maybe, out of Austin, also. Well, most of the stuff on the walls are just things that have sort of happened. See them all the time. shot this right here. There's a fish. How the hell there's a fish in there? Because <laughs> that fish used to hang on the wall forever. And then shortly after this was taken, this came out, Dad got rid of the fish. Somebody asked him one day, where's the fish? <laughs> he goes, I threw it away. Why? There's no barbecue, man. There's no fish. <laughs> and the guy goes, but, welcome to Dad's life. <laughs> but this was taken just a few months before uh, Stevie Ray died in helicopter. Uh, so here's a good example of this. This is our business card wall. Speaking we've of which. We've got some old cards, we've got some new cards, we've got stuff that's falling off. People just treat it sometimes just like a shrine and will leave not just cards, but sayings, pictures, flowers. They leave all sorts of things along this way. So, because it's so dry here, things like this oh, they find up there too. Well, uh, the tape, the adhesion dries. Oh, they yeah. just sort of flake off. So, I've got boxes, I'm not kidding you, literally boxes of these that all need to be reattached. And that really just means I just need to add a little wall yeah. of, these, yeah. of these boards and then we'll just take them and we'll put them on that. That's so cool. Um, but they're, you know, they're from everywhere. I, sometimes, you know, I had my epiphany about what I am and what this place is when I was sitting at the end of this table, just kind of staring at these walls one day. And it was before the map, but you could read where people were originating. And it really just started to dawn on me. It's like, holy shit, they're coming from everywhere. <laughs> This isn't even, then I can hit me, you know. This isn't my place. This isn't even, this isn't my family's place. This belongs to everybody who's up here. This is their place. And this is sort of like the bricks of ownership. You know what I mean? Because if you took all of the collective time, both in travel and in actual experience in this building, that everyone has had, and you put it on a timeline, and then you put, Everyone who's worked here, especially the family members, on a, on, a, on a collective timeline, and you compared the actual duration of time between the two, what we've spent here versus this is just a single s sliver of time. It makes up no time at all. That's when you realize it's really, it's not your place. You're just sort of captaining the ship at the moment, but it was here before you, 
you know, fuck it up, it'll be here after you. <laughs> right? And, and, and it will go on. It's not, I realized what an institution was at that moment in a way that I hadn't understood it before. So that's when I, I truly realized that you know, all of this is for everybody. You know who that is? Wally McSpadden. He's a photographer. He does some great work in the barbecue world. Hey, Robert Lerner. Uh, I guess that's your you replacement fit. <laughs> right? There's as many, I would say, well known places that are represented up here as there are in these boxes as, as you'll find in any magazine. It's, it's truly a crazy place to sort of leave your mark. And what really is interesting about this is it started over there in the smaller board in in small towns and I don't I'm guessing in larger urban areas it was the same but before there were yellow pages in a way to find commercially find services or contractors if you needed a plumber or an electrician or a carpenter and you didn't know one you went to a community board and you put up a notice I need a sewer dug at County Road 7 number 6 right and the first plumber who could do it would take your notice, come out to your house, make sure you still need it done, and then do it. That's how shit worked. Yeah. yeah. Old school yeah. Craigslist. Old school yeah. Craigslist. Yeah. Except it was just literally, you would find it at post offices, at grocery stores, and they had, you know, my grandfather had one at the grocery store over there, so we had one, of course, here. And, but as more and more salesmen started coming into the area, and business cards became a thing, Instead of leaving full page notifications, they just started leaving business cards. And so it was literally from almost the moment we started in here, late 59s, early 60s, that business cards began appearing up on the walls. And they have been in rotation ever since. And I think it's truly one of one of the lifelines of, of what this business is, and it's a constant reminder, and it should be to all of us that, you know. There's your box. But it's not me. These people pay the bills, not me. I just write the check. <laughs> they pay the bills. Don't confuse the two. Seriously, wow. right? Wow. So uh, this is probably one of the more iconic uh, settings in the restaurant. Over here, there's at least a couple of images of my father and grandfather. school of mine, uh, went to Monsanto for the summer to work in the copper mines, I met my grandma from uh, Montana. It's a beauty. No, it's a beauty. Um, and she convinced my grandfather to quit school and to take up occupation with the Safeway Corporation. Her brothers worked for Safeway and they were doing quite well. So he agreed. He left school, went, trained as a manager, and then they transferred it here to Taylor. Literally to the building across the street from us. That was the safest. So he managed that store for 10 years before buying another grocery store two doors down. There was like 15 or 20 grocery stores in the area. They were everywhere. So he bought one, bought one in uh, 46, became a grocery. Fresh meat market, fresh produce, meat market, just like everybody else in the area. You had a meat market, you were smoking meats. You were making your own sausage, you were making jerky, you were cooking for instant consumption. Nothing out of the cabinet was going to go bad. That's really what it came down to. It's kind of ironic that it's the derivative business or events that survive the primary business. Right? right. I mean, because we're, we're an offshoot from a, a department of a, of a grocery store, and none of that survived. Just some of the vestiges over with things like eating butcher paper, having things wrapped up in, in that manner, um, everything 
of being weighed by the pound. Those are all meat market operational messages that just found their way naturally to how we serve. So that's Grandpa. Grandpa died in 1992. Um, top left is, is my father. Um, that's in 2006. He went to Radio City Music Hall in New York when he was accepting his James Beard Award. I know it's an uncomfortable way. We're, we're working on more alcohol, so this will make it more difficult. <laughs> but, but, but I think at the end of the day, um, I, I don't, you know, at least the way we service now, everybody has an opportunity. You, you, we can clearly see people travel a long way from the time we experience it. The least that we can do is give them some face time while they're here and not just push them through like a damn cattle car. Right? They, everybody deserves a little bit of time. Where did you come from? How'd you hear about this? What's your favorite thing? I got just a thing. You, you like savory? You like sweet? Okay, I got, I got you covered, right? So it gives you that opportunity to connect with people, even for this long, right? Um, which in today's environment is more than most people will get. And I, I, I know people complain about them, right? and, I, and I get that. We offer options. Just call ahead. Pick it up to go. I'm going to sit down and then eat. I'm not going to tell you can. You don't have to wait in the line at all. But I think, you know, just as there are things that sort of inherent to operations of Texas barbecue lines and selling out are just a traditional, authentic portion of what this is and has become. So, you know, if you're going to a restaurant and you're waiting to be, to be sat, um, Sometimes that way can be 45 minutes to an hour. It's, 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 it is the same. Now we just need, to, like I said, we need, we, we'll get bar service opened up where we can literally walk by. You don't have to leave anyone. Half your party can wait in the other room and then run around over that. You don't have to just have one person wake up. You know, there's, there's other ways around this. But I keep going back and forth. Should we, should we not? Should we have Reconditioned and 
least it re insulate it. That's going to be the hardest part. Um, the compressor is going to be easy for that. Uh, but they need a lot of work. They need new rails. Adopted children are these two blocks. Um, my grandfather bought these blocks used from a meat market that was closing in the same year that he opened up this location. The meat market itself had been in operation since 1897. So these had been in operation up until the time he bought them. They were moved in, they were stored up in for a couple of months. Moved in, there may have been six, seven months of non-use. Uh, but then in continuous use again since then. So you're looking at 123 years, 122 years of use, and going strong. And the health department hates them, <laughs> hates them. Yeah. It's the automatic minus five every time I come in, and I'm not changing it. <laughs> no, man, I mean, this is who we are, and this is what we do. Count up the number of people, oh, no, never mind. <laughs> I don't need to jinx anything. I mean, we, we do a very good job of maintaining cleanliness here. Um, the amount of grease that goes on here is a, allows these things to stay sturdy, strong, not dry out and crack in this really arid environment. Um, so they really are like children, and they weigh uh, you know, as much as a battleship. Uh, they're incredible. Yeah. But they're beautiful pieces, and like I said, they're. They're incredibly old. They're, they predate the building, and uh, I can never see not using them. You know? This also is an early component of our history. When my grandfather first started um, cooking, he needed a pit. He didn't have one. It was 1946, so commodities and the retail economy wasn't back in swing yet. We were still coming out of World War II, out of a war economy, so still commodity things like steel, copper, rubber, oil, all of these things were still in short supply, right? So this wasn't just plate steel he picked up anywhere. He had to go drive to Galveston and pick up plate steel from naval vessels that had been decommissioned and chopped up. This is just some steel from an old Navy vessel. Probably World War One, um, though. I mean, they took out and blew up a bunch of World War Two ships too. Shortly thereafter, who knows? I've often thought about. Oh, I'll just throw a name on there. <laughs> History has a way. Karma has a way of really biting you in the ass on that. <laughs> so this is still in use today. We cook on it in the mornings. We cook sausage. So we've got an oak dow, otherwise known as a broom handle. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are quite old. We have some angle iron that runs about right here. Um, and it runs down each side. So we will hang sausage like this all the way across. And it'll hold 320 to 350 links. Don't want them touching. Sometimes maneuver them just right. But it'll hold about 100 pounds, just under 100 pounds of sausage. Um, this has been in continuous use. We still use it for service to, to hold foods, but uh, this is going to have to be replaced for that function fairly soon. Health department is just not going to let us keep it. But it'll still be used to cook. So this type of pit, all of our pits are offset. So nothing is cooked under direct flame. There's a heat source, a fire source, and a box off off to the side of all of our units in its hot air or convected air that then goes through the system and cooks the meat. This one is a vertical flow, which means the air actually comes from a lower position and rises up, comes out of the box and flows up and then out stacks. It stacks about 30 feet up. Um, this thing, if you want to think about what air is doing in this chamber, it's like an inverted waterfall. If you took a waterfall and turned it upside down, Instead of get air falling, uh, water falling down, air is just crawling up hot air falling. So it 
cooks everything from below, kind of at an angle, kind of at a roll. Um, so there's a hot spot in the middle, about this big, and then it gets progressively cooler as you move outside of that zone, which means you got to move meats in and out of the zone because half the time you're in a lag formation. Half of it's in, half of it's out, which makes cooking a little more temperamental, right? You have to just pay it more attention. Um, we use it for white beans, so spare ribs, baby back ribs, turkey breast, and then sausage also. All of that is, is cooked in this type of environment. We have another one outside that we use for exactly the same purpose. It's just that gives us twice the time. Twice the this masonry edifice behind us, this was built in 1959. This is, this is what carried our heavy rev for pretty much ever. So beef ribs and brisket. Um, <coughs> We're going to pull these off really soon, and we'll finish these up tonight going into tomorrow. You might ask, is, is, there's going to be some questions I can already tell based on what they're seeing. Most people don't have cardboard on their grades, much less, <laughs> much, much, much less wrapped around the, the points of their business. When they rebuilt this, it was to, I mean, the grading was to the correct spec, but I think that the, uh, the grease pit is actually pushed quite a bit lower than it has been. Um, we have a lot more air coming below than we do coming above. And so we're having some issues keeping the flaps from going. Um, the cardboard acts basically is, is a uh, insulator. It pushes that convected hot air away, um, keeping a lot of the heat, especially in the water vapor, will give you the point in the back of the glass is transferring that heat. It will allow it to skip over it and move over. Um, and you can even see, tell by color the difference in how much, how much heat and cooking is in the bottom. Um, when these are loaded, we'll look at We'll have say 20 grits of air. And they and they rotate, we rotate them manually um, because we have to. The far end is a firebox. We have incredibly high heat and the first chamber is just water pan, the second one is for beef ribs. Everything moving back will hold about 20 grits of per round. It's all all brisk. And we shift them in this direction, move them up to a front line and so that main Anything about classical military engagement. Basically, you had rows and columns that met on a very large field. The two front rows clashed, right? And they all did battle um, until they got exhausted. They retired to the back, and the next row would step in and fill, and they would just keep going to the line and row. This is a very similar way, except you know, the opposite line is to be coming this way. This is our offensive line. Um, we come, we'll let them do battle with the heat. Push the internal temp up, move them to the back, don't add much more heat to it, it doesn't matter the problem. So we can step up the internal temp over time. Otherwise, we'll just leave them in the same position. Those will never finish. These will finish too fast. These will overcook. The ones in the middle will usually fare the best. So, um, and since the rebuild, we've had to make some adjustments. And how do we convert off some of the, the lower areas of, of, of airflow? We do it both with on the bottom end of it, hardboard on the bottom. We don't allow full flow of air. We give particular areas that, allow, that we allow air to come up through. We always point the point back toward the uh, firebox, going into the wind, so to speak. Um, the best, uh, the best visual I try to give people. Younger people don't get it because they don't know what the space shuttle was, but. This is like a space shuttle, and the end of the point is like the nose cone of the shuttle. As it re-enters Earth's atmosphere, the atmosphere thickens, more friction develops, more heat is deposited on the nose cone, you see it glow red. That's where most of the heat is deposited, and that's where the thickest heat shields are located. 
not back on the, on the coils on the wings. Same thing here. We don't. Most of the heat's being transferred right up in here, where we have direct impact with the air. Back here, it's more ambient. What is the chamber temperature? And that's what those will, the flat will sit at. So, and this is the true convected air. So there's not a whole lot of smoke that we're going to get deposited because they didn't. Smoke was a byproduct that at the time they weren't really looking for. Um, they were looking to try to minimize the smoke, believe it or not. The main is giant exhaust. You'll notice you'll have 8 inch, 12 inch pipes depending on your uh, equipment. Literally, our exhaust is 4 feet long by 3 feet deep. It's just like a chimney, a fireplace chimney in your house. I mean, that was what these were built on. This is sort of a prototype and understanding um, how to create dynamic airflow in a passive system. It's all done with fitness. So um, this is where my four and a half years of, of, of engineering academic training actually comes into play. Um, when you're moving from a large volume, any, any liquid will, uh, any fluid, liquid is just one time, there is enough. Going from a large volume space to a small volume space, you have an acceleration that generally occurs, especially if you can taper, put a taper or bottle in into that system. When you do that, literally, you're pushing air into the space. It's like putting your thumb on the end of a water hose. You have the same volume of water that's coming out, and it's coming out at an accelerated rate, right? So this happens in this system as well. Back here, fire. Expand the, the air around, just like a hot air balloon. Pushes through the system. It forces air to go through. Forces it into this chamber. This chamber, then, as air is going up through it, it accelerates as it's moving into the smaller space. As it accelerates, it's also creating vacuums here and there, which help to draw up even more air. You see another another breakdown in volume. It's up in that space that you'll actually see the bacteria pack, which is, you see it every day when you flush the toilet or you run the water in the sink. Do you see water circling the drain? It does that, just the opposite way going up. It's the easiest way for a fluid to move through a system and eliminate and deal with the head pressure that is trying to push it through. Because the atmosphere has weight and has density. This air is lighter than that, and it's trying to get up through there. It's having a hard time. So the best way you can do it is to swirl around the edges and not confront it directly, but run it around the sides. It works both going down and going up. So the last you know, 20 feet, 15 feet, that are an 18 inch pipe, 20 inch pipe, that carries all the way to the top, where air is moving across the top, creating like a straw effect. It creates a vacuum there. And it doesn't take much air to do that, to literally to pull the system out. So you've got a vacuum that's pulling air up there. You have points where air is being accelerated in this direction, and you have an initiation of expanded air here. So what they did is literally take the system using simple physics. They just think about an observation. Not and created something longer and longer and longer and found this, this still applies. And now have a, a totally different way of cooking. Instead of having direct coal cooking, they can cook in a much slower way. Except this is all convected air. And none of this, this is not recirculated. So in a, say a propane tank, in most enclosed uh, offset smokers today, you have a very small exhaust compared to the, the chamber that it's coming from unlike this. So you are able to, to retain a lot of heat because of the metal encasement and because of the small exhaust. Heat and smoke. More of it in today's environment. Today, in this environment, smoke was just, how do we get rid of it? How do we minimize it? We just want to cook this stuff. We don't want to add more to it. So this was, this is, you know, a proto offset because most of the ones that were before this were all direct. You would have long pits like this, but 
people were shoveling holes underneath. And you had entry points all along the way, right? Um, these were the back of the pit lane. Right? This is how the style changed. And the offsets truly became, you know, these slow smoke apparatus. So this dude has been in, in, in operation since 39, it was, or 59, but it was also the one that caught fire in 2013, and this bottom section had to be replaced. Um, the last of seven grease fires that occurred in the, in the pit, in the grease can. And um, I'm gonna scare the shit out of you. It's an occupational hazard that we all face, and it, it, I almost say that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Because no matter how, how diligent you are at keeping everything together, you can talk to anybody who's been in this business for a long time. Shit happens. Murphy's Law still rule. You know, as much as we try to eliminate it, it's still um, So back in the day, when we first built it, we didn't have restrooms. This was our restrooms. And people were a little smaller then, as you can tell by the door signs. Yeah. Right? So this, these are set up in a very unusual way. There's an antechamber and then there's the lavatory. So each of these rooms is, I swear to God, no bigger than this. You walk in and on the side, over here, there's a rack. Um, we're we're um, in uniform jerseys. We're hung for women and for men. Staff are back there. That was mostly just storage. This, um, little empty room with a single light bulb in it, dingy, looks like you're going to be interrogated anymore. <laughs> and then you go to the, the, the actual laboratory, all the pictures, it's like you know, walking into some country house that's been abandoned for 100 years. All the pictures are in there from the 1950s. And it's all just the way it was. When they stopped being used in 2000. Um, we started using the ones possible. It's a time capsule for all of them. It's the craziest thing. So when we do take these out, we'll make tables and take out of the planks. Um, or I'll just rebuild this wall somewhere with the doors and everything attached. But uh, we've got to find some use for the laboratory. It's got some cool old stuff. You, know. you can also always tell who locals were and from people from out of town. Up until, say, the late 90s. All the locals came to They would come right in, go to the restroom, <laughs> then go around the front and order. And if you were from out of town, you parked in the parking lot over there, and you came in the front door, it's kind of like, yeah, visitor. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this section that I'm in now, this was added on in 59 as well. This was a, a cold smoke room. So this was a cold smoke room dehydrated. So jerky and dried sausage were, were made in here. So this, this piece is old and it really needs to be refurbished but the whole thing opens up and you just roll racks in there. The difference in how they utilized it, it was offset to, there's a box on the far end, except they would build a coal base and then they kept sprinkling sawdust, saturated, just soaked sawdust over this, and it would just smoke like crazy. And this chamber would fill up, and they would just hold the smoke in there for days. So this would be a two-day smoke. And the pellet smoker was going good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is going to be, so in our new kitchen, um, this will be the new pit room. It's going to extend further out over. Um, Welcome to Texas. Thank you. Um, so we'll extend this room out to the property line here and over to this slab. So it's about a 40%, 45% increase in square footage. And we'll punch metal all of this so you can see what's going on inside of it. Right? It'll also give us separation from the kitchen, right, a firewall the kitchen and in this space. And this area is, is <coughs> being a bar. 
Um, so we'll have people serving drinks, we'll have food and smoke wafting out this way. Yeah, feed the beast. <laughs> Never ending feed the beast. <laughs> uh, behind you is our close smoker. He's, he's, he travels with us whenever I do an off-site cooking. Um, haven't seen much of the western U.S. Have you seen my, my pits? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you know, um, we use this, this will be used in places by the cellar. Um, this back here is, is our other acolyte that we're using. Just like the ones we serve out of. Um, dimensions are almost exactly the same. Our wood, so we use these shipping containers for additional storage. In another, and this is where we have all of our wood activity. We'll have them drop. I use three wood supplies because they're all flimsy as hell. You can't depend on any of them. So, I mean, if you got three of them, chances are one of them's going to make it. But, I mean, it's literally, I mean, it's just nice. Playing chances. So, um, we'll have. We'll have them dump, drop wood, and then we take it from here and we sort it. And this stuff we can use right away. It goes in here, it goes inside. Um, things that have to be returned, like that whole bin right there, has to be returned to the last supplier. And everything that can be split is then stacked up over in that direction. Why does it have to be returned? Uh, because it's just too. Uh, so like the naughty. Which works well in your backyard, Kent. Right. <laughs> I mean, I can burn them, but it doesn't give me the constant burn that I'm looking for. I mean, some of them are really dense, and so they'll just smolder for a long time. Others are really dry, and they'll flare up. They're, you know, they're unusual size, so you can't burn them. Um, because of the way some of our pits sit, you really have to build them sort of in a lattice, sort of a higher crossing. Um, Four hours ago. No, we're due for. <laughs> shut my mouth. That's why I shut up when we were. When I, I'm like, I almost said something. Like, no, 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 no. No, it's, it's gonna bite me. All post oak wood. Um, Attention to theme here. We don't have post oak, man. <laughs> I'm using the next best thing. That's right. And so it doesn't matter. Barbecue oh. is built on. What are the cheapest ingredients that are most plentiful in your area? Yep. Right. It's, Geography. It's it's all about what's here. Because yep. this is remember this is all peasant food. Yeah. Right. This is not something that we're not. Hoity we're toity. not for fine dining, and, and people can't afford to pay ten times as much as they should. So it is. You got to get it out as cheap as possible. So there's a lot of cattle. Right. There's a lot of post oak, and that's what your family members are for. To be your labor. It's true. Kids. it's true. Why did I start working when I was eight? Because everybody my age who, who was part of a family business, they did the same thing. That's what my father did. It's just, it's what my, my grandfather did working at uh, the barbershop when he was a kid for his father. I mean, those are, that's just how you did it. If you had a farm, you're out milking the cows, right? I mean, everybody had their chores both at home and with any kind of business because that's how you made it work. And no, I mean, there's not the necessity, right? I mean, back in the day, it was it was an essential component. And you had big families because, you know, a portion of those kids aren't going to make it. I mean, when you had 50 percent, you know, survival rate at the turn of the 20th century, I mean, you, you got to have, you're, you're, yeah, you're planning on at 
least try it for eight or nine with the hope of, you know, garnering five to, to adulthood. It was nuts, and it was worse even before then. So it was just, it was, it was the way families survived if you weren't, like, independently wealthy. And it was really before the rise of corporate America. So this was, this was the independent stage of American business um, when 70% of, of all employment was, was directly associated to small business. Um, that's changed quite a bit. But yeah, it was before the enactment of child labor laws, which <laughs> when these things were established in law, and they lived long past child labor laws too, I promise you. you know, the feds aren't out here snooping around seeing if you're employing 10 year old kids. They don't really care. So, um, mugs out of sweatshop with a thousand of them. <laughs> sort of thing. But, you know, the space itself hasn't changed much. This is what, you know, all the years we were expecting this to be. Right. So, it turned out, it was just going to be storage space, like we're using these. Yeah. That's what the first one was going to be. I'm like, no, I think we can do more. You know, I can think I can create some of this space. So, this one we created a couple of bathrooms. Uh, we've got some storage on this back end. This one will be a bar when it's built out. Yeah. Um, we'll have a, uh, a, a service window and then we have a, uh, our cocktail window. the bar as well as really try to read uh, and buy it from the local participants. They don't want, right now, if price point's too high, they don't want to wait. But we've got a lot of trimmings for a lot of burgers, we've been making a lot of dogs, we're working on wings, chicken, wings and legs. Um, yep, all, all the basket and finger foods, totally, right? So, so put a little, little uh, stage and have a little lot of music in the corner. Well, so we were thinking about actually in this area, um, that's the main route coming into town is the downtown. So as there is, there's like three more bars downtown. If we will light this up, light this up, and we'll make this, you can't miss things as you're coming right, into the right. downtown, downtown space. And if they're hearing music coming from the same space right in this area. So all of this has been wired, pre-wired already to accommodate music and like party um electricians have already been through all of that so now we just have to sort of finish it out and vision that um, but just i think it's just another avenue by which you might there's always a breeze coming seemingly out of the out of the northwest so it tends to come west northwest out of this space right here and just like the chimney inside, it funnels you know, from this bigger space into that smaller space, and it sort of wants to rush through there. So right in here, there is always an incredible breeze. Over there, it's stagnant as shit. Right. Okay. It, it, so we've got, I've got umbrellas. Um, I still have to drill the hole. But um, now that these are look weathered, I can finally stain them. I want them to look old. Just kind of lock it in. Yep, and then just lock in that that sort of weathered look. And we'll have umbrella seating out here and covered seating over here. And we'll have bar service there. Probably have some TVs out here too. But, you know, sporting events, why not? Why not? And this can almost be, so that this can be a standalone in and of itself. It also gives us a chance to rent this whole thing out, right? Without interrupting in 
internal at all. And literally, we could run, I mean, we're looking at a lot of different rental space, even the whole venue space. I mean, Austin doesn't have enough of these. Uh, that building's going to right there. Increase the lines of us. Uh, well, yeah, but if, I mean, if it's city that used, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, that's just pent up uh, resources and revenue that somehow you should tap into. Absolutely. Something. And at the same time, if you can expose more people to what you do, and how you do it, then maybe make a few disciples go off the way. Right? It's kind of that whole idea of bringing the trailer out here, giving it that backyard kind of Yeah, totally. Yeah. Absolutely. I like that. I like that. And so in that, in that hole, uh, we're going to put, uh, we've got a, a new walk in. It's actually going to be a freezer. We do a lot of shit. shit. And I just don't have the mirror that goes in the thing. So that'll help. Um, but other than that, man, you know, this is, a uh, it's, it's sort of like the NFL, it's like camp, it's like the NFL Hall of Fame. You got the orange squeezer, sort of, the main building that was built back in the 50s or whatever, and then everything's been an add-on to it. That's what's Everything's just an adjunct add-on. 